It's just after I see a movie, I like to go get a piece of pie and talk about it. It's sort of a little tradition I have. Do you like to get pie after you see a good movie? Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Queer Film Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Rowe, and I'm here with my contributors. Say hi, boys. Hi, I'm Max Pepper. Hey, everybody. I'm Rob. Hey, I'm Matthew Jackson. Thank you so much for joining me this week. I'm excited about this episode. We're talking The Birdcage and in and out and we always like to go in order. So we're going to start with The Birdcage. Um, I know this was uh, Rob's first time seeing it. Matthew, had you seen it before? Yes. And Max, I know you, you and I have talked about it. You've seen it before. Oh yeah, this has been heavy rotation back VHS as a kid and back with my old theater company. We stole from it as much as possible. So this one's got, been as ingrained in the blood as the next movie on our list. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Well, uh, like I said, we're talking about The Birdcage. It's the 1996 uh, remake of La Caja Falls, the famous French film and play starring Robin Williams. Nathan Lane, Diane Weist, Gene Hackman, uh, you know, uh, who's who of, of 90s comedy stars? Well, not Gene Hackman, I guess. He wasn't very, he wasn't <laughs> known for his comedy. Art. Uh, yeah, it's a fabulous cast. Uh, what do you guys think? Who wants to start us off? Well, I was, I was just going to kick off, I guess, by saying, um, I, I know, Brian, I've been badgering you about this movie for a while. Um, and it's partly because, you know, in thinking about formative gay movies, uh, for me personally, this was really just like a watershed moment for me while watching movies. And it's the first um, movie that I can remember as having a uh, a prominent gay character and prominent gay storyline uh, that didn't denigrate its characters, didn't reduce them to a joke. Yes, there's a lot of jokes about how queeny they are, but it's less uh, from the son's point of view. It's It's less from the straight man's point of view. It's more from the gay couple's point of view. And that was just something that was really um, powerful to me. And especially Robin Williams, who was an actor that I was like growing up in tandem with, uh, you know, via Aladdin and Hook and all of these things. It was just really important to me to see him in this role. And it's, you know, revisiting it, I'm sure it doesn't hold up quite as well as uh, uh, certain other movies, but it, it, yeah, this was my, my first time seeing it. Um, so I, you know, I, I don't have that nostalgia for it, but I definitely remember being aware of it existing. It was coming out right around the time I was starting to be teased for everyone assuming correctly that I was gay. And so even some aspects of it that seemed funny at the time, I knew it was something that I probably shouldn't like express interest in wanting to see. And then I don't know how it's escaped me over the years other than I assumed it was a, a huge farce about this, you know, th this man being forced to act like a woman in order to meet his, uh, the parents of the girl that his son wants to marry. And something about that just always struck me as just a little cruel, a little mean. And, and like, and coupling that with the fact that so many people hold this movie in such high regard made me you know, never really seek it out in, until, uh, you know, we discuss doing it here. And it, it's really interesting because I, I, I mean, the son's an asshole and Calissa's not much better. And don't get me started on Gene and Diane, but they're characters. But it, it, it's almost like the movie didn't know what it wanted to be. If it wanted to be this like touching look at like a, a family with two gay dads, or if it wanted to be this big farce. Like, and I almost think it would have worked better for me. I, I kind of want to go see Lacage now uh, because like, I, I, I'm curious if that has more of a farcical element to it. Uh, if you take out that uh, American sentimentality. And uh, I, I think that maybe would have worked better for me because it would have helped me forget just how much of a dill hole the sun is. Like it just, I just kept going back to that and it, it stopped me from laughing at some parts that were truly funny. Uh, so that was my experience uh, coming to it with fresh eyes in 2021. Well, the reason I wanted to pair these two films together um, and you kind of touched on that when you were talking about how uh, when you were, it was coming out of the, around the time that you were 
sort of showing your your uh, <laughs> tendency, shall we say. I was 16 and 17 when these movies were coming out. So I we talked in our last episode, the Tarantino episode, about how those two films were so formative for me. These two films were almost formative in the opposite way, where I was slowly coming around to the idea that I might be gay. But both of these movies made me like feel like I didn't identify with any of these characters because... Uh, especially at the time at 16 and 17 years old, I was like, I don't like any of these things and I don't like any of this music. Like, I don't understand why that has to, that, why that, ha why that makes you gay. Like, and it was really, and I remember seeing the movie in the theater in and out um, and the locker room scene, which we'll get into, but the locker room scene, everybody was laughing and I was just sort of like mortified at the, A, at the people that were laughing and the things that they were saying. And it was just like, I felt so sort of like, rejected because of these two movies. I remember The Birdcage. My parents didn't take us to movies very often. And when we they did, it was usually with like neighbors and friends. But they there was a night where we were all going to go to a movie. And I remember my mom asking, do you want to go see The Birdcage? I wanted to see The Birdcage because I liked Robin Williams. But I also like knew it was about gay people. So I didn't want anyone to know that I wanted to see the movie about gay people. And I was like, no, I don't want to watch a movie about a bunch of faggots. Like, I swear to God, I answered that to my mom. <laughs> so these two movies have, have had that sort of, not hold, but uh, influence on my life. Uh, and there's two films that I've sort of grown to love over the years. Uh, but at the time, uh, in both cases, I was uh, kind of rejected them. Well, Brian, that's an interesting point, because I remember some similar feelings of myself growing up around this time when these came out at ages 11 and 12. And while I, you know, embraced uh, these movies and especially in and out later, there was a nervousness. I remember watching these with other people, knowing that these movies were seeing me and as a closeted young kid and wondering how everybody else around me was interacting with the film, reacting to it after they were laughing, but was it a mean laugh? Was it a, was it a good laugh, you know? But I mean, this is, this is where, I mean, these are seminal, you know, gay movies, queer movies. These are kind of go-to when people think of uh, American gay films in their heads, but they're not for queer audiences. They were not made not all, for not gay audiences. These were pitched very specifically for conservative middle America, so much so that that's, that's the plot. That's the plot that is built into both of these films and which it spins on. And with The Birdcage, it also comes with this time-tested formula, the story that had been, you know, uh, a huge success for nearly three decades already over in France through, you know, a series of plays, through the musical, through lots of other different types of tellings. So it really kind of came at the pinnacle of... of uh, La Caja Faux's popularity in America as well after this big successful uh, musical that won a bunch of Tonys. And so there was a little bit of this type of like Broadway and and really mainstream accepted, uh, acceptance that really broke through in, you know, the biggest way a gay story had in American film, well, maybe ever. In that sense, I, I think of it a lot sort of as it has a certain kinship to like modern family and other other properties like that that are really intent on pushing the needle. Um, and it's it's funny. I mean, you guys both spoke about queer movies that provoke this sense of like dread for a closeted audience member uh, in watching them. And I, I feel like I had that experience with many other movies, but not The Birdcage. And I'm trying to understand why that was for me. I think it's a little, that's a good question. I, I, it's a little bit of, I think Brian and I are of a certain age and, and Rob too, of, it was a little bit of like, we grew up with the mask for mask, you know, kind of bedded in us that if this was the type of masculinity and it was like, this is something to be uh, laughed at. This is something to be judged. And so there was a touchiness, even though that these movies radiate joy, radiate acceptance, have a lot of other messages embedded into it. It just came with that type of, you know, um, a little bit of trigger of, of, you know, a wince just because of like gay stories were not being well told, uh, you know, in the 90s and before and, and for decades beforehand too. Um, I think for me, it, I think there is a generational aspect in that because I, and also just in where I grew up, I grew up in Arlington, Virginia, which was hyper progressive. Um, homophobia was not absent in sort of the social climate there, but there was this really kind of almost overbearing atmosphere of like, everybody needs to know from day one that it's okay to be gay. You know, we were showed, uh, we weren't showed like the Trevor Project in, in school, but we were showed 
uh, videos of like these teens who had committed suicide because they were gay. You know, it was a very socially conscious environment in a way that almost doubled back around itself and made it that much more <laughs> difficult and, and pressurized to be gay in such an environment because everybody was constantly looking at you and being like, are you gay? Like, it's okay if you're gay, but you need to know that it's okay if you're gay. And, you know, there's just sort of an inherent inertia to the closet experience that no matter how accepted uh, you think you will be if you come out, it's, it's always difficult to come out. Nobody wants to come out. Um, but so for me, the kind of like triggering Hollywood representation of gay people was this much more sanitized, maudlin, sentimentalist, you know, story about like, isn't it so tragic that gay people are, you know, treated the way that they were this, you know, these poor little homosexuals that's put on our violins, you know, our string quartets. I think the most emblematic movie of this for me is a uh, single man, um, you know, where the whole point is it's like, Oh, he's misunderstood. He's a misanthrope because all of society is against him. Uh, which was, it, it's sort of what it was in the book, but I think they really just amped it up in the movie. Um, and it was that sort of representation that I felt like I was seeing at all ends. It was either that or really like cruel comedy, you know, very like mid aughts, like fratty kind of comedy about gay people. And the birdcage struck this balance for me, I think that was, you know, it was, it, it was unsentimental. It was um, funny and it was extravagant, but ultimately I never felt like they were the but of the joke. Uh, watching it now, I feel like that a little bit more, especially since I've, I've seen the French version since then. Uh, and I think, uh, Rob, what you're pointing out about the son being a huge asshole, that's not as present in the original, I think. And I think the original is a lot more focused on their perspective and him being a tertiary or a secondary character rather than him being sort of like the glue that ties the whole thing together. Um, but yeah, I guess at the time I didn't see Birdcage as offensive, but I also didn't see it as, you know, hand-holding sentimentalist hallmark garbage. And that's what draw that that's what drew me to it so much. I, I definitely agree with you that um I that I, I don't think this movie is at any point trying to be harmful or looking down at, 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 at the gay community. I I think that um I, I, I think their heart is in the right place. And, you know, you mentioned earlier how important it was for you to see uh, Robin Williams in this role. And, you know, I was very nervous starting the movie to see which Robin Williams I was going to get, the one I can tolerate or the one I can't. And it was, I, I actually really enjoyed his performance in this one. And I had to remind myself that our stories at that time were not going to be told without straight actors playing them and so like I thought he he really committed to that part in a really genuine and heartfelt way and then I also was thinking last night uh as I watched this about how much shit we gave Nathan Lane as a community as a community for taking so long quote unquote to uh you know to come out when he was using that kind of place in the closet for the longest time to like to still accept roles like this, which, you know, other closeted gay actors weren't doing. So um, I, I really, you know, kudos to, I think both of them for their performances in this movie. And then kudos to Christine Baranski for being a goddess. I am displaying my ignorance here, but Nathan Lane really wasn't out when he made this movie. He was not. That's not out until almost the mid 2000s. Like no mid kidding. late two thousands, if I can't remember right. But Rob, but I mean, nobody good. was surprised though. <laughs> yeah, no, but well, I like that, that's right how there. he came out. He was like, "Come on, isn't it obvious? You're gonna make me say it." I, be I believe his quote was something along those lines. Well, and there's that moment in the movie too that seemed almost like, you know, poetically to mirror real life in that respect. When he, you know, when they put on their their straight men clothes, their suits and everything, and he comes out and he looks kind of like a facsimile of a straight guy except he's got the pink socks and they're looking at him like kind of like scrutinizing him and he's like oh I know what that look says that looks that that, that look says that even though I look exactly like you there's just something inherent about me that you can't you know it it, it ruins the facade like you 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 know you see through all of these outward signifiers it doesn't matter how I'm dressed it doesn't matter you know how my hair is combed it doesn't matter you know if I'm sitting completely still and not being you know a big floaty queen you can just see something about it and I mean I feel like you know, th this is kind of, I guess, the 
the internalized homophobia of it all, but that's sort of always how I felt about people like Nathan Lane and people like Liberace, right? Like people that people have always known or suspected have been gay. Um, so it's, I mean, that's just me saying like, it's, it's, there's people like to talk about homosexuality being and homosexuals being an invisible minority in that you can closet yourself, right? Like a lot of minorities are subject to outward scrutiny just because their otherness is visually apparent. And that's not always the case with, with gay people. Um, but I think that a lot of that argumentation does ignore that some people are not invisibly homosexual. I like that point. I mean, I think the through line between both of our movies tonight is, is two big, broad, brassy comedies that point out how goddamn silly the closet can be for people who should just be big, broad and brassy uh, to, to a big extent. Um, and, and while this is pitched for, you know, a non-queer audiences, this is not something that wants to preach to any choir. Um, but, you know, it's still a point that I think holds up that makes both of these movies hold up today. And, and you know, I, I do feel like, you know, when I did come out to, you know, especially like extended family and stuff, you know, like, like, I remember my grandma talking about thinking in and out was funny, you know, like, but before I had ever seen it before, um, before I came out and, and, you know, that I, I, I don't necessarily hate the fact that they're, you know, kind of tailored for a straight audience. I, I just feel maybe a little, a little left out, like, you know, kind of how I do watching Drag Race now that it's moved to VH1 from logo. I feel like there's something to this point that it's like, it, it matters when in your life you've seen these movies. Um, like mm -hmm. I'm wondering specifically, and we can talk about this more with in and out but I was watching this movie, just having a ball with it, but also kind of like aware in the back of my mind, I was like, if I saw this when I was like 13 or 14, I would have hated it. Um, you know, and I think, I think there is something to be said with watching something with a different level of self-confidence or a different level of, I don't know, awareness of who you are. Um, and that a lot, and it's, it's like that gay tradition of, of being able to sort of reclaim movies that are, are kitschy or over the top or just completely camp. Um, I think that same sensibility can come to movies with bad representation or movies mm -hmm. with just less than stellar uh, representation, you know, like there's a sense that yes, you're aware of the intention of like how these characters are crafted to appeal to a straight audience, but they're so ridiculous that almost like the crafting in and of itself speaks to like this this camp absurdity of like yes these characters were made for a straight audience and this is what the straight audience consumes isn't that just fucking ridiculous like it's it it's layers of irony doubling back on itself but consume it they did like looking this back up again like it made over a hundred million dollars it was a gigantic hit in america in 1996 that's like marvel money i think if you kind of put in or like second tier marvel money like a like a wasp movie maybe if you put in for the inflation yeah well it had robin williams who was probably one of the biggest stars at the time uh and this was just another one of his hit big hit movies uh but matthew i want to go back to what you were talking about how it matters when you see the movies uh in your life because i think that is exactly why as i was talking about earlier when these movies came out and I was 16, 17, and I wasn't ready to watch, I basically wasn't ready to watch movies about gay people with other people. Um, and when I did, I felt like it, even that they were all laughing at this thing that didn't represent me at all. But like I was saying, like I also said, like over time I've grown to, I've grown to have a lot of affection uh, for both of these movies. Um, and I kind of have this theory that I have been working on as I've been watching these last two films. Um, it seems to me, and I just looking back on like mainstream sort of movies and releases, you almost get the sense that like in the Clinton era, the 90s, Hollywood was like slowly but surely like telling queer stories. And at first it was like the birdcage and in and out where you had established straight actors playing gay. And it was sort of like introducing everybody to this sort of concept, right? Like, and slowly oh it's taken 30 years and i do think george w bush set us back but we're just now getting to that point where we are able to tell our own stories in the when it's when it started it was necessarily led by straight people by but like liberal straight people like your mike nichols and elaine may and robin williams and gene hackman and these people that have been in hollywood for years and have known queer people their entire lives 
and are just trying to tell that story. And I think it helps that the Birdcage had the the La Caja Fall. The fact that it was a remake, I think, really helped it break through as well. Because if it had just been an original property, I don't think it would have. I don't think it would have attracted that talent. That's a good point, Brian. And it's one that I think of like both of these stories in let's like when we break them apart are kind of about the two safe queer spaces that were around kind of at the time, though, too. Uh, Birdcage coming out of theatrical community made by Mike Nichols, you know, out of a theatrical director. Uh, in person long time in the industry and then one that parodies Hollywood you know and in the the back padding that came with the type of uh, straight people giving portrayals and how brave it was to for white men to play other white men <laughs> and I think that that's kind of like built into built into the structure of both of these and why both of the directors and the cast that ultimately fell together for both of these projects are perfect and why I think the Burge Cage is so successful because everybody at the right creative level kind of clicked in the right place at the right moment for them. And like you said, you know, Robin Williams is a big part of that, but also Nathan Lane, who hadn't really done a movie yet. He'd been a voiceover actor. He'd been on stage. Oh, Lion he King had just done Lion King. That's what I mean. Lion King was a huge <laughs> hit, but it was animated. So basically yeah. carrying over his cartoon persona to big screen, you know, this was kind of a perfect vehicle for him too. But as Rob said, you know, one of the things revisiting this one is that I, I always forget how like underplayed both of them take their parts, our central couple. Mm -hmm. You know, for, for as wild as this movie gets, Robin Williams is very much, quote unquote, the straight man, and it plays to his strengths. So he doesn't get into his like hairdresser voice from his like comedic days or his 70s stand up or anything else. And Nathan Lane, you know, like doesn't have to play for the back seats if you've like, you've ever seen the producer's movie or something when he forgets that he's in a movie rather than on stage. Like it just clicks because they get what moments need ham and what moments need introspection and and they do a great job but that, i think that makes it work i think that makes her characters work but i kind of think that happens at the expense of the comedy like it was not i mean in matthew you said you saw lacage like is it a, is it more farcical than this one like I would actually say no. I, I, I thought this one was, you know, in, in typical American remake fashion, this was more exaggerated. One of the things that I thought was a notable difference was that uh, Lacage has a lot more genuine character moments between um, Armand and um, uh, what is Nathan Lane's character's name? Um, between the, the, the two couple, anyway. Um, they have... Uh, you know, they're, they're still sort of their, their same character types. They're outrageous in their own respects, but there's a lot of moments of just like uh, domestic marital, you know, nonchalant love. There's a scene where, you know, uh, uh, the Armand character gets decked in a bar and they cut to afterward uh, Albin, who's the version of um, Nathan Lane's character, like icing his wounds and, you know, they're just chattering. And it's it's a tender, understated moment. Like, I I just felt like, um, that movie, that version of the film, was really about these two characters, uh, not as objects of spectacle, but as characters in their own right, who, you know, the straight people are in a way the objects of spectacle in that version, because the son plays right. uh, less of a, a central role. Um, the conflict is still the same, but it very much does seem like they are not the objects of ridicule as much as Robin Williams and Nathan Lane are in the American version. One thing that I think is interesting that I like cannot stop thinking about since watching it yesterday, and it's the same thought that came up in you know watching you know like Tu Wong Fu or something like that. It's just like Hollywood doesn't know how to paint a drag queen, and it finally clicked. Hey, that, hey, that, that, that drag queens didn't know how to paint drag queens before HD cameras came around, though, too. So come on. No, no, like it's no, it's terrible. You in all of them, you can, like even Nathan Lane when he's supposed to be playing the mother, you can see five o'clock shadow, and it finally clicked that it is intentional. This is to make the straight men in the audience feel safe because none of them are fishy. None of them are going to be attractive. Even, you know, the, the super gay, actually gay, like, chorus dancers are, don't have good drag makeup on. Camp is accepted, but impersonation is not. And they were not going to put a fishy queen on in 1996 or 97 or do anything that was going to confuse audiences. They it's, have it's a totally a different effect. movie yeah. if, if Nathan Lane is passable, right? Like, yeah. it's a totally different situation if, if she can't get clocked. 
but that also some of the humor goes if the the mom doesn't have a beard yeah yeah we might be getting in the m butterfly territory then instead because <laughs> it's a whole different movie rob <laughs> I mean, I, I think about this a lot too, and I, I think you have a good point that, you know, there, it, it's, it's this balancing act of trying to make a movie palatable for straight conservative audiences, because that's how you push the Overton window, right? Um, and, and also trying to have genuinely good representation. And I mean, I brought up Modern Family earlier, and a lot of people had just social objections to that show's representation of a gay couple. The fact that it took them like, God, how many episodes for them to even have an on-screen kiss, how they were, you know, depicted as, as kind of like a honeymooners, you know, borderline like abusive, not abusive, but like they, they were not, you know, I feel like a lot of the time gay people have to be bickering in these movies, gay couples have mm -hmm. to be, you know, old school kind of like argumentative queens in the way that like your Dick and Jane were in like 1950s sitcoms, they can't have genuine moments of affection. Um, and that's in a way, it's it's this like weird blend of like normalization and also prejudice, where it's like, oh look, gay gay people can have like domestic arguments too, but you know we don't want to show them doing anything genuine. But at the same time, like in the case of Modern Family, you have these two, th this gay couple who really adhere to kind of uh, you know conservative America's view of what gay people are, but they also, you know, they, they lure people in, they get a lot of people to love the show. I mean, personally, my, my uncle uh, was pretty homophobic for a time. He watched Modern Family, his opinions literally changed. So it's like, these things, yes, they're, they're yeah. problematic in their representation, yeah. but there's, there's something about, you know, bringing people in and like, changing things from the inside. I don't know. It, it, it feels like a compromise, but there, there's something to be said for it. I, yeah. I agree, and I there there should be, and there should be, gay characters made for in in product in um, productions made for you know a predominantly straight audience, and there should be gay characters you know it's, you know for us. And I, I totally get your point that it's doing good work, um, you know, in within that community. For my dad, it was queer for the straight guy, the original. Like that's what. Uh, for my, for my mother, it was uh, L.M. DeGeneres. It was her talk show. Nice. Um, now, their, their, their relationship is very asexual. And even in the moment when his son, when uh, Val is talking to Robin Williams, Armand, about uh, why are you, you going to let... Um, why are you going to let Albert come? Like we did, we talked about this. He doesn't even say, because I love him. He's my, he's, you know, the love of my life. He's my partner and my friend is what he says. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they can't even acknowledge that they've built this life together. And there's a few moments where they are, I, I really like that, like that kitchen, not the kitchen table, but the, the dinner table scene where they're like practicing. They really do feel like in that moment, they've known each other for years, but there's not a lot of that in the movie. Yeah, but I also think that that's a bit honest of, well, where the trajectory of this story had been building out of to show queer people finding a family together. But also remember, I mean, like it was only around now where, you know, the expectation for gay couples was to go towards a heteronormative marriage and children and this type of route. I mean, Birdcage is still actively making fun of that. I think the biggest buffoons in the movie likes to make this point is our conservative family and our couple. They're the bigger draggy queens. Their outfits and their hair are bigger than our drag queens in this movie. You know, Calissa <laughs> Flockhart and Diane Weist are, are our queens to a big certain extent. And that's what I do love out of some of the political points this makes though, is that, listen, they're together because they want to be together. They're not together because that they got married or they got pregnant or that this was the best decision for both of their families. They were just two people who were around each other all the time for shows that might be pissed off at each other one day and a little bit more, but created a queer family that was built off of being a friend and being a partner. And that's why I always respect about that scene and that kind of feeling that this movie brings is that like, no, our relationship is different than yours. And the most ridiculous thing that happens in this movie is when we try to squeeze ourselves into your box, that it fucks us up so much that like Armin has to come out and drag looking like fucking, you know, Gillian Anderson in The Crown. <laughs> Speaking of that whole, you know, non-heteronormative found family dynamic, do we want to even crack open Hank Azaria's role in this? 
<laughs> I did a little bit. I had uh, I was I was checking I was checking his. I had to admit I had to check his nationality this time around, um, and I had even just texted it to Brian and Rob that uh, he comes from a Greek Spanish Jewish background, and it was one of those things that I was just kind of like, does he get a pass? But the thing is, is that I think that Hank Azaria got a pass for like three decades because of The Simpsons, though, too, is that like that comes into a bigger, larger portion of like, you know, Hank Azaria is very good at doing this type of stuff and impressions and voices. But like, where does like a poo stop and like our appreciation for this character begin? That said, Hank Azaria is a trip in this. And like, of course, is like ingrained on like my young memory and is like super fucking funny. It, you, you just made me realize that the the central trio of of uh, of guys in this movie are all like prominent voice actors. Robin Williams may be the least, but I mean, like he he did voice act for the genie in Aladdin, and I feel like that that sort of I don't know. I have you ever seen the the documentary? I know that voice. It's a documentary on on voice acting in in cartoons and stuff, and they make the point that voice acting is fundamentally different from regular acting or, or stage acting because they're you know, it, it all has to be conveyed in the voice. There has to be a certain knowledge of musicality and how, you know, you when you voice act, you don't just speak as if you were on a soundstage or anything. You have to give your entire character into that voice. And I feel like there's something very draggy about that um, that lends itself well to these performances. I didn't think about that until now that just all, all three of those guys are, you know, prominent voice actors. That, that's a really good point. And I, you know, I, again, I, I don't think that, uh, you know, Hank came from this character from like any place other than love. It doesn't feel like he's having um, fun at the character's expense. I, I totally know, know that, that character, but what kept taking me out of well, it. We've dated that character. Who, who hasn't? Um, I, I, the, his body, his, like, it, it, don't get me wrong, it's a very <laughs> good body. Hank was looking great in those short shorts. But that, that, that swishy gay queen, especially, that, like, just, that, that wasn't the body type that someone who wanted to be a drag queen would have worked hard to get. And it just, like, that, that, pulled me out a little bit. It, it reminded me that it was a, a, an actor playing a part, which usually doesn't happen with Hank Azaria because he's, he's a good character actor. So we, we've talked a lot about the, uh, our gays, but what about those boring heteros? I mean, we, we've already general consensus that the sun is terrible and Cliss is not too far off, although that moment about, I really wish you were going to like, I was really looking forward to you to being a part of my family was, Adorable. Um, but what about uh, Gene and Diane, who we love as actors, but hate as these characters? <laughs> I love Gene Hackman. Um, he's fine in this. Uh, Diane Wiest, uh, as I was, I, correct, I said it incorrectly earlier in the episode, Diane Wiest. Uh, I've always loved her. Um, yeah, I, lo I, I, love, I love them. I don't love the characters. But she actually almost makes how awful she is palatable. She's very like Barbara Bush that way. <laughs> We're like, she's so sweet though. Well, there's a lot of Oscars between them at this point to pull that That's across. True. I wish they didn't get such a like pass at the end of the movie. Like, I mean, I mean, it's exactly what happened with the, you know, the Reagans, right? You know, Nancy's friend gets AIDS and then all of a sudden they give a shit about it to some degree. It, I, it was, you know, it was just another example of that. It's, oh, we hate gay people, but we make an exception for these two. And they're very good friends with the Bushes, which is quite telling. <laughs> yeah, so we've talked a lot about the birdcage and the performances and its social sort of uh, what it's meant. Uh, but does anybody like it or hate it or what are, what are our general consensus? I, like I said, I have kind of grown to love it. I love its sort of snippy dialogue. It's very like Elaine May. I love, there's a lot, so many great quotable lines. Um, I do think it's my favorite Robin Williams performance. It's my favorite uh, Nathan Lane. So I've come, I've come around on it a lot. What about you guys? I think it's easily a classic, but it's a classic because the story has been told over and over again. And I think this one will survive as a, you know, a family's clash and, and we settle our differences and it's, it's, 
an archetype, it's a trope, but it's one that I think is successful and will continue to be successful as a nice time capsule for where America was in 1996. And as Brian said too, and as we get into our next film, before the George W. Bush years really like quite, you know, violently beat a lot of folks back into the closet for another decade, a nice little shining moment of what maybe this type of like Clinton era, third way type of queer was at this point, um, even if it was pitched to middle class type of audiences and, and not able to have queer artists, you know, do what they did. But, you know, at least still a nice time capsule. Yeah, I'm thinking I, I it's, it's really hard for me to like dissociate how I feel about this movie now from how I felt about this movie when I first watched it. Um, I was a little bit, not disappointed, but I, I re-watching it, because I think actually for the first time since I'd seen it when I was like, gee, I don't know, like 12 or something, um, I was like, okay, yeah, you know, there's there's the typical sort of disappointments of like, this is maybe not as um, positive as I remembered it being, but it didn't really color my, my affection for the movie all that much. Um, I I do have to say, uh, was it, Rob, was it you or Max who said, you know, which Robin Williams am I, am I going to see in this movie? Was that you, Rob? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was, I, I watched with some friends, like, right after this, the, the Altman Popeye with, with Robin Williams as Popeye, and I was like, oh, <laughs> fuck, that was not birthday. His first film role, he showed uh, you who he was. <laughs> yeah, I, um... I mean, I, I fully acknowledge, you know, I know that this came up when you talked about The Sandlot, for example, you know, like, nostalgia goes a long way, and I I just don't, it, it, I don't have it for this movie. I, you know, on Letterboxd, I went, like, back and forth between, like, two and two and a half stars, which is, like, it has merits, like, it's, you know, and I, I think, had I seen it in that time period, it would have been much higher, um, and I, I really appreciate it for, like, what it is in its place in uh, gay film history, but I don't see myself necessarily putting it back on again anytime soon. Uh, though there, there were a lot of uh, nice moments. I do have to say, and maybe this is better reserved for the say something gay about it at the end, but um, even though it's like totally against the message of the movie, when both Robin Williams and Nathan Lane came out in their like straight man suits, I was like, God damn, <laughs> you know? It was it was a, a moment of like kind of cognitive dissonance where I was like, I know that this is totally, like these are supposed to be their boring looks, but they look really good. Um, well, I guess we could go ahead and move on now to uh, 1997's In and Out starring Kevin Klein. Uh, Max, I know you're a fan. Do you want to go over the plot? All right, yeah. Well, in and out, uh, 1997, uh, big picture. Uh, plot being Howard Brackett is our English teacher living in Indiana with Joan Cusack. Um, they uh, were teachers in um, a school and their favorite student and former student, Cameron Drake, played by Matt Dillon, uh, wins Best Actor at the Academy Awards for his portrayal of a gay soldier in the parody to serve and protect. And in his speech, he outs accidentally uh, Howard saying he's gay, uh, making many assumptions that lead us all into making an ass out of you and me for the rest of the film, especially as Howard holds on to maintaining that he is a straight man. Um, this was a pretty big hit also in 1997 and led to a lot of bevy awards for its actors and uh, people behind the camera and especially for uh, one of my favorite actresses of all time, Joan Cusack. Joan Cusack was nominated for an Academy Award for this role. It was the closest she ever came to winning too. Who ended up winning that year? <laughs> Kim Basinger of all people, oh. like potential. You know, I had not seen this one. And you know, again, I, I think there is just some, you know, I, so much time had passed before me seeing it and I, I knew it was so beloved and I was a little nervous about the, the subject matter. And uh, I was surprised by how much this one won me over. I realized that, you know, again, it's a movie for a straight audience, but, you know, that moment where he finally admits at the end that he's gay just breaks my heart. And it's such a good performance. And it's, it's, 
it's just this wonderful moment where you can see the pain that he's been living with. And I have to like think and hope that the straight audiences saw that too. And it also shows them, I mean, how do you get someone interested in an issue? You, you make it personal, you make it about them. It shows how someone being closeted in your life affects your relationship with them and it affects your life. And, you know, I, I think this movie probably did a lot of good. And I, I think there's some great performances in it as well. It, it took me a second to click with what this movie was doing at first, because it's so, I, I guess it, it took me a while to realize how campy this movie was supposed to be. Right. Mm-hmm. It, like I talked about camp earlier, but man, it's, it's just so legible in this one, like towards the beginning before and, and leading right up to the Oscar speech uh, where everything starts, you know, going downhill. It's like, you know, it's that special kind of Americana, like small town kitsch that you see in like Christmas movies or like Norman Rockwell paintings or, you know, Hallmark originals, you know, like it's so deliriously cheesy. And at first I was wondering, okay, is this like the sort of Oscar bait kind of brand of cheesy? And then they show you the clips from um, the the actor stand in in this movie, Cameron Drake. They show you the clips from the movie that he won the Academy Award for. And it's like, it, it's like fucking Tropic Thunder. It's like Simple Jack. From <laughs> it looked just like the beginning though too. It lets yeah. us in on this world of like, oh, by the way, let's take this rug. This is a parody too. You are in a cartoon. And by the way, like Frank Oz, the director, this is my cast of Muppets. But it takes a little while to get there. You're absolutely right. And, it, it, and so it was like, I, I was actively like trying to figure out what is, you know, what is the intention behind this movie? Who is the intended audience? But once I, I, I feel like I clicked with the mood that it was setting down, I was like, oh, I love this. Um, Max, I'm really curious. You, you were like ready to defend this movie when it came up, sort of against like a presumed like audience of haters. I, I'm really curious to hear your take. Well, you know, I, I, well, for who our listeners are out there, though, too, or, or people hopefully will watch this for the first time, I spent a good couple of decades. I loved this when it came out in 97. I've always kind of quoted, or quoted it as one of my favorite gay movies. Um, but I do think that there is a consensus, maybe within the critical community or within a lot of the queer community, that this one is passe. That this one is like, you know, um, the first couple seasons of Will and Grace. Or that this one traffics in stereotypes and it's mostly um, straight actors and it's mostly this type of like, again, misunderstanding of it that it's made for middle America and it's about cuddly gays and everything else. And it just isn't. It's a Paul Rudnick script. It's at the height of his bitchiness and the thing is just extraordinarily funny um and if i can just say without getting on a larger type of rant one of the things i've always tried to that i considered this movie even at a young age was that it started to point out of not just how silly it was to be in a closet but in 97 through a lot of this type of uh through the 90s was that there were these type of closeted gay characters on television and movies these type of screaming sissies and queens and then they just called them straight I call this like the Niles Crane coding or the Veronica. Richard on Carolina in the city. I was about to say Richard on Carolina in the city, Veronica's closet coding. You used to have your queers and you could eat it, eat them too. If you said that they were just married with a wife and had two children. And so what I really kind of thought of this movie was, was trying to really kind of kick open that stupid fucking closet too, is that Howard is this type of archetype of this, obviously a Nelly in every type of thing and Oakley loves Barbara Streisand and everybody in his life knows this and accommodates this and appreciates this because he's a passionate, lovely fellow, but they also accept him pretending to be straight because that's the story that's being told and will continue to be told. And that this starts off with these wonderful parodies, like like you said, you know, before Tropic Thunder, before things, it starts off with these almost mean-spirited kind of Paul Rudnick parodies to be kind of like, save yourself, save yourself, Hollywood, from patting yourself on the back because the whole script genesis comes from a Tom Hanks Oscar speech. The whole God spark of this whole script in this movie was Paul Rudnick watching that and being kind of like, fuck you, Tom Hanks. You don't get to like thank your like, you know, theater teacher and out him on national television so you could win an Oscar for playing a gay man in one of my least favorite movies about gay people of all time. So I also have like a place in my heart for this to be kind of like, it came from a very bitchy place and it goes throughout that for the entire film, except that it's so open hearted. It's so warm hearted. 
And then it became a huge mainstream moment and a mainstream hit, kind of like exactly when we needed it, all the way to being that it was nominated for an MTV Best Kiss Award. Like, that's how big this movie was in 1997. And so I want to kind of like, I'd like to celebrate things that might get forgotten a little bit. And this one was a seminal moment that I think gets kind of like swept under the rug. And it's still a funny movie. It's still a lovely movie. It's got the things that age it poorly. Um, but like everything still works for me in a big way. And it has Debbie Reynolds. Yes! None of those other movies have Debbie Reynolds. <laughs> I think that's such a great point, specifically about how it's, it's poking fun at, like, the um, everything but uh, you know everything but the logical conclusion idea of like well we accept that you're feminine we accept that you like Barbra Streisand we just don't accept you know the the quote-unquote logical conclusion of all of these signifiers and and to the open-hearted nature of it like I and and to the bitchiness of the writing like so many of the sort of tells that his his students his family his neighbors were pointing out were comically positive. You know, there's that scene where he is returning to class for the first time after he's been outed on national television and his students are kind of like playing devil's advocate for him. They're like, well, we understand why he might think that you're gay. I mean, you, I think the words they use, they're like, you are clean, you are nice, you're a basic, you're, you're clean, you're smart, you're basically a decent guy. And it's, it's this moment where they're, you know, it's, it's, it's both kind of like a joke on, oh yeah, obviously he's gay, but on the other hand, it's it's just sort of putting all of these positive stereotypes out there, and in his class, it really comes to bat for him. And you know, Girl, he has his, yeah, you too much toothpaste to be in Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> and when and when he goes to his his bachelor party, uh, his his buddies like they set him up, and he expects that they're going to show him like an R rated video or an X rated video. So he's he's turning up his machismo, and he's trying to be one of the guys, and they're like we have Barbara Streisand, we know you love her. And he oh. tries to push back against that. He's like, oh, I don't, I don't like this stuff. Why would you guys do this? And they're like, oh, well, you know, we brought this because, you know, you, you put on that film festival a year ago and you made us watch all of her movies. That was really fun. And so it's like, it's this really- Warned my heart. Yeah. yeah, you get the sense that the people care about it. They're just stuck on what it means to be, to be labeled gay. It's, it's they never- love Howard and they don't, they, they, they like him in any way that they can get him. They try to just meet him at his level, which is what I think is one of the sweetest things of this movie. I also think it's- They've never met a gay person, and they it would never occur to them that they were that he was gay because they've never met a gay person, and they have nothing mm -hmm. to compare it to. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a good point. I think that that like we are so used to like that being one of the first things that we try to like identify about a person for safety reasons and for lusting reasons and for camaraderie reasons, like. We if, we, if we see a person, if we meet a person, we, you know, we, we tend to try to figure out if they're part of the tribe or not. I was so used to, you know, high school where any effeminate thing you did got you teased and everyone was on the lookout for that. That when I entered like normal adult life and people just weren't asking that question about you, um, you know, it, it was different. Even, I, I, I don't know a good transition for this, but I mean, like, even the, the oh, captain, my captain ending, right, where everybody stands up and goes, I, or, like, Spartacus, like, I am gay, I am gay, well, I, you know, I am his brother, so that must mean I am gay, like, it's, it's, it's ahead of weird its kind of, like, yeah, go ahead. It's ahead of its time a little bit. It's a little bit of kind of like actual queer theory, if you want to think about it. It's a joke. But I mean, like, you're right. This Dead Poet Society ending is like, aren't we all a little bit gay? And I'm just like, yes, that's the fucking point. I, I also appreciate about this movie, um, you know, growing up in a, in a small town, uh, not in Indiana, but in Illinois, uh, with some very lovely, well-meaning people that I, I think this movie did a pretty good job of showing a humanity to the rest of the town uh, that, that I really appreciated. You know, there were, there were lots of jokes, but the jokes never felt mean-spirited or, you know, at their expense in a way that I think uh, really invited everyone watching the movie to really feel a part of this community and then go on this journey with the community to accept Kevin Klein being a big old homo. 
Rob, that was a good point. Like I revisit this movie, I think somewhat often, but it'd been two to three years for me. And for some reason, I always think that there's more time spent in Hollywood. That there's more time of like this biting satire, but like, no, that was like really only kind of contained to the beginning and a little bit of the edges. And especially as Matt Dillon comes back to town, but for the main point, like it really just does settle itself in this town and the real aftermath and the real human beings, rather than any of this type of like archer overly campy type of storytelling. It just happens at a heightened, more cartoon level. And that comes from, again, our director uh, being a Muppet himself and who was really kind of on a hot streak through a lot of this point and through the 90s uh, before he ended up making the Stepford Wives after this, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> but that he also had like a very gifted cast. And like, you know, like we'd said out of Birdcage before, this was like perfect timing for a lot of people involved. And I think very specifically for our main you know, quote unquote couple at the forefront, but Kevin Klein and Joan Cusack. And Kevin Klein, I mean, really has been one of my favorite actors for a long time and is another one of those rare theatrical based actors who knows the exact amount of subtlety that he needs for a scene or the right amount of ham. And like there are things that he sells during this that are like wouldn't leap out on a written page that you need somebody of his caliber to be kind of like when he dances to that, you know, that 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 scene where he's listening to, you know, become more masculine and don't dance to this. And like the comedy is kind of there on the page, but you need his like manic energy and like the dance to actually be good and like like hot and like fun. And like like that's where this movie like meets its moment, in my opinion. It almost feels like the moment where he is fine. That feels like the moment that he's finally like, oh, I'm gay. Like at the end of it, he might as well just say, say that. So that's sort of his sort of like his own coming out to himself. Oh, that that's fascinating. Because um, like right after that, that, it's like. Much earlier in his life, like years before this movie ever began. But I think that moment is the moment where he realizes that he's not going to be able. He'll never hide he's, it. He, he's never going to be able to hide it the way that he's been trying to. I got to say, like, this this scene that he's got and with the with the record talking back to him is kind of like its own repeated gag or trope throughout it. But it also kind of, like, reminds me of, like, Stranger with Candy. Like, there is this type of, like, subversive, like, camp John Waters queerness through this line that, like, when I revisit that scene, it's both hysterical and it's heartwarming, which is, again, I think this type of twinned energy of this movie that, like, not a lot of other ones can match. And I also think that a big portion of that comes with Joan Cusack. I think that mm. this role written on the page, if played by a different person, might not age well, might not have been like nominated for Oscars or anything else. This character rides the edge of a lot of issues. We have somebody who is, who is making the kind of like Monica from Friends, like I'm formerly fat jokes of like, I can make fat jokes, but I'm skinny now. You have somebody who like ends up with her student at the end, even though that Joan Cusack was only two years older than Matt Dillon at this point. And you have somebody who has a lot of these big breakdowns and who's supposed to be this kind of like, oh. but it does not matter when Joan Cusack's on screen. Because when Joan Cusack's on screen, she can twist that dialogue around and she can milk every moment like she's known out of movies for the past decade that she's got from Working Girl to Adam's Family Values to this, that you know that Paul Rudnick and Frank Oz and everybody behind the camera is kind of almost secretly making this film for her too. <laughs> In its kind of way as like I love, a spotlight. I love her moment at the end when she finds out and she's like, I'm in a wedding dress. <laughs> like the, yes. just the way that she says it. There's Do such we, a, was this part written for her? Like with I mean, because Paul Rednick also yes. wrote Adam's Family Values. Yes, yes. That, I that think that it was in. written for her. There's such a but that's the thing is like there she has that, like you're right, she has the the formerly fat, like as a sort of a character descriptor. And if but if it's like if you think about it, um they talk about how she's been in love with Howard for so long and she lost weight to be with him and how they've been together for three years and they've never had sex. Like that's, a, there's a lot <laughs> to unpack there in a different movie, but they really kind of, and I think it's, it's Joan Cusack's performance is credit that that does, that they don't play that for that sadness. Because it, yeah, you're, that's a really great point because if, if, if someone else plays that part, um, 
a little less extreme, a little less that that Joan Cusack trademark. This was kind of my point about the the bird cage riding, like not getting the ratio necessarily right on like sentimentality or farce. She plays that farce, which allows you to laugh instead of cry, because it's actually a really sad moment that this woman has that that. Kevin Klein's character put her through this, that took advantage of this other human being like this, and that she so was so excited and so willing and put so much of herself into it. Like that that's a devastating moment, but we're able to laugh at it because of Joan Cusack's performance. And I think it's genius. Rob, and that's our hero. This is what this movie has like asked us to do. And it was like technically cheated with a kiss before that moment. Like imagine if like Emily Watson was cast or something, you know, like if there was almost anybody but Joan Cusack in this role, this becomes more heavily drama. But there was like one actress that the screenwriter and everybody else knew that just being like, she's gonna be able to sell this. We're gonna be on her side. And that's why I think that the quote unquote reward or the like, you know, Mrs. Robinson type of thing with with her uh, student at the end isn't creepy, even though that it's kind of its own joke, like in its own way, and, and they would kind of resolve it, is because it's just like, I don't know. It's a certain thing I miss out of farces and like 90s sitcoms and a lot of other type of comedies that I feel that we don't have anymore. But like the Shakespearean of like, let's pair the secondary characters off so we have a completely happy ending. Let's make sure that this comedy, like everybody's served and everybody's stories are served. And that's why I like always come to the ending of like in and out thinking of it almost like in a type of way of like, everybody's taken care of. Everybody found their happiness in one way or another. And that was done on purpose. Well, and there's something, not to discredit Joan Cusack's performance, but like everybody in the movie, nobody is a serious character in the movie. Nobody has a serious sense of like emotional stakes or, you know, like profound interiority. They're, they're, they're all, Muppet. they're Muppets, exactly. Everybody is so outrageous. And that's like why just from the, the five minute mark, the impression that I was getting, everybody's doing these, like they're acting like they're in a commercial, like for Febreze or something, right? Like everybody has this completely <laughs> overblown manner of speaking and interacting in, in you know, it, it is almost like a stopgap to be like, okay, don't, you know, don't project too hard onto these people. Don't worry too much about what's going on behind the scenes. Like these are characters, these are, these are Muppets, exactly. And everybody, I just, we've talked about this with uh, the Birdcage, the cast too is just so well filled out. Uh, we've been, we haven't even d- discussed Tom Selleck or Wilfred Brimley, <laughs> or even Lauren <laughs> Ambrose, Brimley. or even Lauren Ambrose who shows up for a hot second. Day. Yes. Oh my God, Wilfred Brimley was great in this movie, but I will I will never forget. Every time I see him, it's like you know the the role that defines a person. For me, it was diabetes. Him in, no, for me it, initially yes, but for me it's him in I think Hard Target, the Jean Claude Van Damme movie. Oh, yes, like, he's, he's, he's like a Cajun Rambo. Oh my fucking god, <laughs> amazing! And so the whole movie, I was just like, this guy's gonna kill somebody with a bow and arrow at some point. Has anyone else here but me seen 1994's The Firm, starring Tom Cruise? No, nobody. I have. I've oh, seen oh, it a yes. number of times, by the way. Uh, Wilfred Brimley is a, a, a creepy villain in that if, if anyone listening likes this kind of paul rudnick writing uh you know like adam's family values like in and out i encourage you to find the script somewhere to one of his off-broadway plays that i i just unfortunately don't think will ever be performed again but i love it dearly it's called the most fabulous story ever told the first act is Adam and Eve and their lesbian friends, Mabel and Jane. And they like, the first act is them like going through the, the Old Testament. And the second act just takes those four characters and throws them in like post AIDS New York at like a Christmas party. And like, it shouldn't work, but it's a wonderful script. And uh, I was in a very bad production playing the role of Adam poorly once upon a time where my grandma saw me naked on stage, but it's a wonderful script. (laughs) And I, uh, I encourage you to, to try to find a copy of your library or something. I, I, I saw that production with Rob in it. And you did. Brian saw me naked in that. I, (laughs) I encourage you all to find a production of it that does not star Rob. (laughs) 
<laughs> I did not play. I would love to play that part again now, um, even though I'm no longer an actor because like it was, I, I was shitty. It was, it was not a good performance. I didn't have enough life experience. I didn't bring this up to, but I did want to talk about Kevin Klein's performance and how, and we, I know we've discussed uh, straight actors playing gay. I think we, and actually I watched this with Rob and we talked about like other possible people who could have played it. Um, I think he's perfect in that you have to believe at the beginning that he's a straight teacher and then you have yeah. to buy all of that, but yes, you also but have to buy it later when he's gay. But Brian, I think, and what you and Rob have already brought up is that like our high schools where we grew up in the Midwest and a lot of other type of places were littered with these English professors. Right, with right, English right. Professors, with everybody else. Like, Are you listening, Mr. Six? Among, we, like I went to Catholic high school. I went to Catholic uh, college. You know, like closeted teachers were like expected. Closeted monks and priests and nuns were the du jour. So there was like kind of like, hey, this is like the glass closet type of experience in the kind of like late 90s through the 2000s for myself, um, you know, that, that, that Kevin Klein kind of brings to this role. And again, here's an Oscar winning actor. In fact, his Oscar is used in the film, <laughs> which I think is funny. That's who they, that's what they hand to Matt Dillon is actually Kevin Klein's Oscar from a fifth ball. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. Yes, I think that that's so sweet. <laughs> well, and I think what works so well too is that it's, and, and what keeps him like masked for until he's outed is that the whole town is just really gay. I mean, like it's, it's the whole town is really gay and that it's like this, this Thomas Kincaid like snow globe village. Like it feels like it came right out of like a Kenny Ortega like, like high school musical yeah. thing, right? Like it's everybody's, <laughs> that's that's right. everybody's theatrical. Yeah, no, I think that's a good point. It allows us to like buy him easier as straight in the beginning because like every everyone just has like that tinge of, well, they're written by Paul Rudnick. Of course, they're going to seem <laughs> a little gay. But, but I like this point. It's just kind of like, it's almost the high school theater's production of this story to a certain extent. It's kind of like, this is Howard Brackett playing, you know, Jimmy Stewart in, uh, you know, It's a Wonderful Life. Like we all did in our fucking high school plays, right, Rob, right, Brian? Where we're just kind of like, I'm straight, you see, I've got a man suit on. I just yeah, think and I mean, like, it, it, the kids in his classroom are like, you know, tell us about, tell us about Cameron, whatever his name is, Mr. B, like, how was he? Oh, he was dreamy, wasn't he? Like, it's this whole, <laughs> it, it's this whole production, the whole well, world. Well, you know, fucking, you know, doesn't need, like, one sexuality or another. We will be universal. Um, have we discussed, or do we want to discuss, uh, noted gun rights activist Tom Selleck? Well, can uh, we, like, actually just say what is the most jarring thing that you see in this movie and is in his entire career was that he shaved his mustache for this movie for like why i'm not quite sure he's still a handsome man but i do remember even in 97 and to this day i'm just kind of like you look you look simian like your your upper lip is so big you almost have a chimpanzee's mouth like that that mustache was a very important thing to you being an attractive man. But here's what I, you know, like we're already gonna start probably talking about say something gay about it in a little bit, but like that kiss kind of meant something in 97. And it's not like mm -hmm. it's hot. It's not like it's hot at all. It is a comedic kiss. But it's here's a comedic thing, like, kiss. I bring, up, I bring up that like MTV movie kiss thing, like for an example, because like, listen, Cruel Intentions, what was, was next year or very close. Like we started getting like the lipstick lesbianism. We started getting a lot of other type of things, but that this was a big enough of a cultural moment that the movie stops dead. It really does for what, about 60 seconds to watch, you know, like the histronics of Kevin Klein's character do his Niall Crane's type of act until he finally oh. leaps into the kiss and enjoys it. But you know, by the time that he actually enjoys it, and we've been watching a kiss straight for almost 60 seconds between two men, between two masculine men, between two award-winning men, you know, like that's not something to be discounted. You know, I talk about like, you know, I, I, I spoke earlier about my grandma, like saying that this movie was funny and that, you know, I, I made the little like mental note of like, oh, like it'll be okay to come out to her. Like, you know, it actually was the other grandma, but like, I, I remember like we got her this mug from like Goodwill that said like, I'm saving myself for Tom Selleck. Like she had a big Tom Selleck crush. Like, 
I, I think it was so huge <laughs> that this like that this actor that so much of like a certain generation either lusted after or wanted to be was comfortable playing this role and had that kiss had it it was such a long kiss like it i i, I know like the the gun stuff sucks but like it, it like kudos for taking that part and it, it was a really nice moment out of the closet he's the one that brings howard out he's yes. the one that brings all of this to fruition to a big extent and well and what's so interesting about his character to me too is that like any potential you know type uh, typing or like stereotyping of his character is overridden by the whole like scuzzy journalist thing. Like, you know, he, he is not <laughs> as a story angle, you know? Yeah, like you would expect in, in these kind of movies, like the, the character who gives our main character his gay awakening is like a flaming queer or is like written large, like this is the gay character. Um, but even after coming out, uh, Tom Selleck's character, it's, it's, he has, you know, he has this character type that is completely just superseding any of the gay stuff, which I just thought was really funny. But like still believable as gay, which I think was so nice. Cause I, I think if you don't see like the one helping the other one out of the closet being super gay, you see the opposite, like a super self-assured, super masculine guy. And I think, I mean, yes, there's, an, you can't argue that Tom Selleck doesn't have that to a certain degree, but I, I, I feel like he let his guard down a little bit in this performance and, and let a little bit of femininity come through. I, it, I could also say let a little bit of like Los Angeles come through, to be <laughs> fair. But, you know, it's a nice, it, it's nice. It's a nice performance. I, I, watching both of these movies, like instead of like ranting against like straight actors playing gay, like made me thankful for these these straight guys that that told these stories back then. I'm just thinking about the the point about him shaving his mustache, and really, I did not recognize him until the credits rolled. Um, and frankly, to me, he had this kind of uncanny nature, where I mean, he he reminded me of those people that that uh, Eric Andre gets on his show to play like knockoffs of famous actors, like the guy who plays quote unquote George Clooney who looks like simultaneously nothing like George Clooney and yet like a really uncanny facsimile of George Clooney. Like he just looked bizarre in a really alluring way for most of the movie. And then when I saw that it was Tom Selleck, I was like, okay. He, this is so funny and I have to ask Brian this question. Like he always came off of like the character he, it was the gay version of like the character he was doing on Friends for Monica. Richard, like, yes. It was, like, it was the gay version of Richard. That's yeah. a good point, actually, yeah. There, and there is a moment when uh, Monica and Richard are briefly back together where he does not have a mustache. Uh, but I feel like we could probably start wrapping up, yeah? Does anybody have anything they wanted to, to add or, or to throw in about these two films? We also didn't talk about Bob Newhart, but I think we're I mean, all- I, I love Bob Newhart, but he was doing a perfunctory role here. like. Like someone needed to be the foil. Like Bob Newhart's fine because you're not going to hold it against him too much. He's your favorite little mouse in a hat that solves mysteries. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> Actually, he's my second, third little favorite mouse in a hat that solves mysteries because it would be the Great Mouse Detective, and then Bianca and then Bernard. Um, well, yeah. So if we're gonna wrap up, does anybody have a say something gay about these two? Uh, gay 90s movies. I feel like Robin Williams in Birdcage gave me some kind of complex because growing up he was definitely like my movie dad. And then he <laughs> yeah. stop in Birdcage and I was like... Mm-hmm. Even with those flowing pants. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Brian, I got to say something gay about it. But it will not be sexual this time for I think the first time Doesn't in a long time for me in this type of wrap up, even though that Kevin Klein was one of my sexual awakening early on, being the Pirates and Penzance uh, filming that they did and his sex scenes with Jamie Lee Curtis in A Fish Called Wanda. But I think the say something gay about it was something that I clocked and I had to look up in trivia was is that in the fake Oscars when Glenn Close comes up, they have a music cue for Sunset Boulevard. And I think that that is the mm-hmm. moment where I'm like, oh, this was written by Paul Rudnick. 
That is the <laughs> baggiest thing that is going to happen in this whole movie, and I love it. I mean, you could have just said Glenn Close is your like say something gay about I it. The could, fact that but there was there was that. like a whole <laughs> there was a whole fag inception happening. Oh no, I love it. I'm so glad you said. It. I'm just saying that another gay thing about the movie is that Glenn Close shows up. Like that automatically like increases the gay quotient in anything. Um, except for maybe 102 Dalmatians. But I also, also Air fun. Force One. There's nothing gay about Air Force One. <laughs> and they used her Fatal Attraction music right afterwards too, with her like reference. Oh, that's amazing. What was the name of the Michael Douglas movie that he was nominated for? I loved all those, I don't remember, I don't remember any of them, but all of those titles I thought were like. Oh no, we're gonna have to look Oh, this brilliant. Brian. The only one I remember is Steven Seagal for uh, Snowball in Hell. <laughs> <laughs> Snowball no really in smart. hell. Oh, wait, no, you're <laughs> right, Matt. That does, no like that scene hell. does a great job of setting up like how seriously you're supposed to take this movie. You know, like this is this is the kind of movie that you're you're buckling in for. So you know, just go along for the ride. And I think that's really important to set that up. Well, it was a nice thing to be kind of like, this is a live action The Critic episode or like the crossover Simpsons episode. Like, take this for what it will. You are in Springfield cartoon land right now and we're going to like bring you into this world. Come along for the ride. Yeah, definitely. I um, Brian, to your question, the movies were called like Geezer and Coot, like two of the other ones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One of, them, one of them had Clint Eastwood in them. Listen, yeah. like, Rudnick didn't have to try so hard in 97 for Clever. Right. Yeah. Um, I think my say something gay about it, and I know I just railed against it for, like, not um, being realistic, but Hank Azaria's body, like... <laughs> body, 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 like, body, body, Like, barefoot with those cutoffs, like... I, 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 we, mo most of us have a, a friend who has long professed her sexual longing for Hank Azaria, and I don't know if I ever quite got it. I got it when I watched The Birdcage. That was very nice. That's the one and only time I think he's ever really. What? Been... He's wonderful in Brockmire. He's like, you're. He's an attractive oh, no, he's good. guy. No, he's good. I don't, oh, I think he's a weird looking guy. I think he's really. Oh, weird. no, I, th I think he's very attractive, but like, he's never made me want to like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he has a great body in the, like... in the movie, but I've, I've never thought he was. I always, you mean that I don't he finally played Twinkie Twunk Robin? <laughs> I'm sorry, Robin? You mean that he finally played Twinkie Twunk Rob? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna leave the Robin one in there, I think. No, That's the one I'm going the Robin. With. Wait, Brian, I do want to say one more gay thing about it. I forgot the Six Feet Under cameos in In and Out, though. A young Lauren Ambrose. Yes. You got a couple of the other people around there. It was lovely. Uh, am I the only one that hasn't done Say Something Gay? I sure am. Well, <laughs> um, I mean, I'm with Matthew. Like, Robin Williams has never really done it for me overall, but he looks good in this movie. He's a good-looking dude. I like the mustache. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's because I'm currently sporting one. I was about to say, you're looking in a mirror, uh, Brian Rowe. So, Brian Rowe. Yes. And with that, <laughs> uh, thank you so much, everybody, for hopping on Zoom and talking about these gay movies with me. I've been excited. I've been wanting to do this pairing for a while. Once upon a time, I wanted to pair in and out with Philadelphia. But ultimately, <coughs> oh, I think this Jesus, I'm so glad you stopped that. Well, thank you so much for hopping on Zoom to talk these movies with me, guys. Uh, does anybody, do you want to hit us with your social media? Yeah, sure. Uh, Rob here is on Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd as paths will cross, uh, just like the Josh Ritter song. Hi, this is Matt. I'm on Twitter and Letterboxd at RatJacko, R-A-T-J-A-C-K-O. And I'm Max Bever at, at Max Bever on Instagram. Thank you so much. I am so Brian Rowe. That's Brian with an I, R-O-W-E, on Twitter, Instagram, and Glutterboxd. Uh, you can find the podcast on Piece of Pie Pod at Instagram and Twitter. Uh, drop us a like, give us a follow, tell your friends. Um, if you're listening to this, uh, we are recording this before the inauguration, but if you're listening to this, you have successfully survived 
the Trump administration. So congratulations. We'll or see you next. never listened to this because we all died in the insurrection. Or that. <laughs> <laughs>